Hi everyone and welcome. This course is about reverse engineering and today I'm going to give you enough information so that next time we're going to be able to have a look at some machine code and assembly. If you don't know what they are, don't worry about it. And so you have a new application and uh, you start having some sort of security concern or you just want to find out uh, whether the application is using the network at all. Well, before you do anything, uh, make sure that whatever you're planning to do is actually legal. Um, now, the next thing you want to do is using very simple tools in order to gather uh, very basic information. So, for example, um, I here have uh, a, an image and I'm going to use a simple uh, text viewer um, which is going to give me much more information than I was expecting because it's telling me that this file was created using GIMP. Hmm, interesting. Now, um, another thing you want to do is that as a, any binary file is going to have its own magic header, which is a number that is describing the content of the binary. So basically all files have one apart from text file. Uh, you're obviously not going to, to do anything with text, text file because there is not, nothing to be reversed there, right? Um, let's see what happens uh, when I... Uh, when I use my... hexadecimal header uh, editor Okay, so here, this number over here is telling me that this file is a JPEG. Very interesting. You don't have to learn all this stuff. Uh, there are tables you can use. Don't worry about it. And then, also, you want to make sure that when you're running the application, you're also running Network Analyzer, you're checking the log files, and if you're running a Windows machine, you also need to monitor the Windows registry for modification, deletion, and so on. Um, and then finally, you will disassemble the application, which requires a certain kind of knowledge, advanced knowledge, but don't worry about it because we'll be talking about it. These registry locations are going to tell you which applications are going to be started when Windows is being powered on or is being rebooted. Um, these are not all the locations that you will need to uh, monitor, but uh, I think it's a pretty good starting point. Now, um, these are the ones that define which applications are going to be started when the user does the login. So Linux machine, analyze Chrome configuration, while on Windows, you will be checking on a scheduled task, if any. Analyze processes running a startup, analyze IPv6 and IPv4 usage and configuration. You might want to disable IPv6 if it's not used. Analyze USB detection and usage. So sometimes you find that USB automatic detection can be disabled. It, it might be safer. Analyze X server configuration and usage. That's uh, Linux only. And sometimes uh, it's a good idea to disable. Uh, monitor the boot directory and making read only uh, if it's possible. Uh, use change root jails wherever it's possible and analyze the path system uh, variable. Make sure that nothing strange is in it, like for example, the dot, or uh, make sure that only absolute paths are in it. And also check all the aliases, because sometimes those might be dangerous. Computers use binary to store and process data, but we often use hexadecimal to simplify how binary numbers are represented. Binary numbers 
can be easily represented as a list of on and off, which is why computers can work with binary systems so well. Let's have a look at how uh, positive numbers can be represented in a way that CPU can understand. So the most significant number is going to be zero, while the remaining seven digits are going to be the magnitude of the number. So then you sum all of these and you get 87. Let's have a look at the negative. Uh, a bit more work, but not that much. So you're going to have that uh, you'll need to write the binary of the positive number and then you calculate the two complement, which is about reversing one and zero. And then you add one to the result and then you make sure that the leftmost number is one. Let's have a look at this example. So that's plus 13 because it's one plus four plus eight. And then you're reversing zeros and one. And then you add one. And then nothing else needs to be done because the leftmost, it's already one. So that's a minus 13. CPU registers. Quickly accessible location available to a CPU consisting of a small amount of fast storage. Some registers have a specific hardware functions and might be read-only or write-only. Computers load data from larger memories into registers where arithmetic calculation take place. Results are then usually stored back to main memory either by the same instruction or by the next one. Registers generally can hold from 8 to 64 bits or even more. And now we're going to be talking about the most common registers. Bear in mind that we are talking about Intel and the Intel compatible platforms. So we have the AX, which is storage for arithmetic operations, CX, shift rotate and loops instructions to keep track of cycles, the X, arithmetic and I.O. operations, but also general storage. The X, pointer to data, located in segment register DS when in segmented mode. SP, pointer to the top of the stack. The address held in SP is the RAM address where the last byte was stored by a stack operation. When data is placed on the stack, SP increments, and as the data is retrieved from the stack, SP decrements. You should not modify this. BP locates parameters passed via the stack and more. SI pointer to a source in string stream operations. DI pointer to a destination in string stream operations. These registers are all 16 bits wide. To get the 32 bits one, uh, you need to append the E in front of the original name and to get the 64-bit one you need to append the R in front of the original name. The least and most significant bytes of AX, BX, CX and DX can be accessed by smaller registers. So for example, AL is the lower 8 bits of AX and so on. Now, segment registers. SS is a pointer to the stack. CS is the pointer to the code. DS is a pointer to the data. And then extra data, more extra data, and still more extra data. Um, segmentation was introduced in 1978 on the Intel AT86 to allow addressing of more than 64 k bits of memory. The modern platform have dropped the support for this technology. Memory is divided into sections. Code segment, stack segment, data segment and more. Hence, these registers identify starting location of these sections. Nowadays, many applications and operating systems have these registers pointing at the same location. 
generally is zero in order to disable them. Microsoft Windows uses GS to store thread-related data, while Linux is using GS to save per CPU information. Instruction pointer. The instruction pointer is the register that contains the memory address where the next assembly instruction to be executed is stored. Flags register is used to store the results of operation and the state of the process. This is a 32-bit register. I'm going to give you some time to read this page and I want you to get focus on this one. That's very interesting. And this one as well. Um, this one also. Yep. You can pause the video as well if you give you some more time. And then next page, we continue it with more flags. That's very interesting. And then that's also quite interesting. Also these two, yep. This two. Okay. And the last thing to be said is that in memory in the x86 architecture the all the objects are written all the way around so a3 a2 a1 a0 is represented as a0 a1 a2 and a3 that will be all for today i hope you've enjoyed my class and thank you very much